Welcome back to this episode of Curbside Consults. My guest today is Dr. Adrian Begay, family medicine physician, veteran IHS employee, member of the Navajo Nation, and senior officer at HEAL, here to talk to us today about global health and global health, what it means to work in the communities that are closer to home and yet still have some of the same challenges as we might see in underserved areas abroad. Welcome, Dr. Begay. Thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate the honor of being here today. I'm so excited to hear all about your journey into medicine and sort of the lessons that you've encountered, the obstacles that you've overcome, and the stories that you've picked up along the way. Before I begin, I'd like to introduce myself and the way that I was taught. So, and in English, it's the introduction of myself and my four clans. I am Edge of the Water clan and born for the Folded Arms people. And then my maternal and paternal grandparents people are also recited. And this is just an acknowledgement of the person that I am, as well as introduction to the audience as far as how they may be related to me. My journey to becoming a physician, it really is a circuitous route. One of the major highlights of my journey began when I was about 12 or 13 years old. My mother used to work for a gentleman who was our first Navajo physician, Dr. Taylor McKenzie. He was an orthopedist by training. She got to work with him when he was the executive director of a federal program called Navajo Health Authority, which helped in developing the strategic health plan for the Navajo Nation in the 1970s. I knew Dr. McKinsey only as my mom's boss. And at one point, he had asked me if I would like to accompany him to the old Fort Defiance Hospital, which was an IHS hospital in Fort Defiance, Arizona. And my recollection of just being there went in to just observe as I stood at the doorway. And there were four beds in the room. And there was a patient in one of the beds who was in traction. And I watched Dr. McKinsey. And Dr. McKinsey, as I just can remember this vividly, had a mustache and he would always twirl his mustache as he was thinking or doing things. And so as he's walking up towards the grandpa, the older gentleman in the bed, the words that came out of his mouth were, yat eshiche, hush and eh, which in Navajo is hello, grandpa, how are you? And that was that moment that I thought, this is a doctor talking to a Navajo patient in his language. I grew up in IHS. I went for my well child checks whenever I was sick. And I had never, ever had a Navajo physician take care of me. And that was the reason why I became a physician was because I had someone here in front of me who was like me, who grew up on the reservation like I did, and who showed me that I too could become a physician. So that's when my journey began. Unfortunately, there were a lot of other obstacles that came up, challenges or rather, that came up. I didn't finish my first attempt at college. I became a mother. And in those interim years, I became a mother of three children and also had issues with domestic violence during that time. But then I knew that I could not raise my children on the salary as a ward clerk or a nurse's aide or a secretary. So I ended up going back to school. And thank goodness, my second attempt was successful. I finished my undergraduate program at the University of Arizona and then went to the University of North Dakota to medical school and it through the Indians into Medicine program, which is the program that has graduated the most Native American physicians in the country, and then came back to Tucson to complete my family medicine residency. And if you ask my children, if they're in medicine, all three of them will look at you and say, no way, or like, that it's too hard. So, but I have two grandchildren who are interested in medicine. That is such a powerful thing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Dr. Begay, that the journey was not straight and the path was not straight, but that 
it still brought you to this place where you are today. And so having the opportunity to really hear about that story is very powerful and moving. Thank you. What drew you back to the IHS? For me, I always knew I was going to go back and work with my people. It wasn't a question. It wasn't like, am I going to do private practice? I always knew that I would go back to work for my people. I did initially, right after residency, I did work with the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa people near the Phoenix area. And the reason I did that was because I did want to experience a different culture and also have more experience before I came home. But I always knew that I was going to work with Indian people. My personal passion is really to elevate healthcare for Native Americans. And so it really wasn't a question of coming back. I want to get your thoughts, Dr. Begay, on how do we earn that trust as healthcare providers, as a system that presumably has the best intentions, although it's not always historically been true. How do individuals work to gain that trust in a system that's not always been kind? That is such an important topic or issue that really needs to be addressed. Because I really am a latecomer to the world of global health. Because as I was training, you know, went through medical school, went through residency, there were global health programs, or there was an advisor on global health if you wanted to go abroad. But that was it. It was never global health, like, oh, you want to go work at the reservation? Or do you want to go to an inner city? It was always a global health club or a global health advisor where you could go to an international site. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until I was introduced to the HEAL initiative, which is a global health fellowship program. And I was still kind of leery of the program. We did have some what we call rotating fellows who were placed at the hospital where I was working in Gallup. And it was through these physicians that I learned a little bit more about the fellowship. But one of the unique aspects of this program was that they not only recruited rotating fellows, and those were the fellows, those young physicians who would actually come to a site on Navajo Nation or a site in one of their partner organizations, but they would also recruit site fellows. And the site fellows were the individuals who were already working at that. So there were an individual who was already working at Gallup. The person did not necessarily need to be a physician because we've had individuals who were recruited from Navajo Nation who are a pharmacist, a nurse, a health coach, a medical assistant, a nurse's aide, a dietitian, a respiratory therapist. And we even had a, an engineer who was recruited from our Navajo area office. And what these individuals will go through the global health curriculum along with the rotating fellow. So they build a fellowship, a community among themselves, but they also learn from the site fellow, the cultural things about the community that they're serving. They learn about the people that they're serving. And at the same time, the site fellows also learn the concepts of leadership, advocacy, power and privilege, and structural competency. And the last part is they're also provided a professional development opportunity so that they could become the next leaders within their community and the next advocate within their community. And I think that's such an important part of this global health, because you're not only bringing in somebody, a rotating fellow who provides direct patient care and tries to elevate the health status of people that they're serving, but you're also building a community that is already there who will actually help to enhance the health of the people. And you know that the individuals who live, they live among their Navajo people. They have already the trust of their Navajo people, but you're upskilling them so that they can become leaders and advocates in their program, in their community. Now, the HEAL program is based at UCSF, is that correct? That's correct. When did you join HEAL, Dr. Begay? I actually was recruited as a site fellow 
back in 2019. And it's a two-year fellowship program and completed the program in 2021. I'm just curious what your initial impressions were of the fellows and what changed your mind from being leery to embracing the program? One of the things that draws individuals sometimes to our communities is something like loan repayment. So they come and they'll get loan repayment and they may be there for two to three years in order to complete their loan repayment and their people leave. Or, you know, a lot of times the recruitment comes from other physicians and our facilities or primarily our locations can be difficult because we're rural. We may not have grocery stores that are close, entertainment things for the weekends that for them to enjoy. But we do have beautiful landscapes. We do have beautiful surrounding areas that people can enjoy. And so when the Heal Fellowship initially was introduced to me, I didn't understand it because I thought, oh, they're just going to be here for two years and then they're going to go. And it wasn't until it was explained a little bit more and then I went through the program and found out that the site fellowship program is actually one in which they're helping to develop people who are there already to become leaders within their communities. But then one of the good things that has happened is we have actually recruited probably a third of the physicians that came out as rotating fellows to stay on within Navajo area, either at an IHS site or a tribally run site. And they took permanent positions and stayed on within the Navajo Nation. Wow, that's an incredible retention rate. I guess that makes me wonder what advice you would have for a student or a resident or a trainee rotating at a IHS site or with a tribal site. What kinds of things can individuals do to prepare themselves to make the most of their rotation? I think my advice to any student or to any resident is if you're looking to do a rotation at like maybe on a reservation, at an urban Indian clinic, at an inner city clinic, is really to learn to know, have some historical context of individuals that you will be serving. What is going on with that community? Why do they have such high rates of substance use disorder? Why are there high rates of diabetes? Why is there high rates of obesity? Why is this community an obstetrical desert in that women have to travel more than two or three hours in order to have their babies? You need to be aware of what you're stepping into. And I know this sounds like a really simple example or a real You're like, that's not important, but it is important. Why did a woman who lives two hours away from Gallup Indian Medical Center, why did she bypass two other clinics or one other hospital to come to Gallup? I observed the young mom bringing in a baby who maybe got ahead of fever earlier earlier in the day, but then they're fine. Baby's laughing, baby's drinking, baby. And they're like, well, why did you bring the baby in? Well, they had a fever this morning. And they're like, well, just this morning, why did you bring the baby in? I just want the baby checked. And they're like, you know, and I've heard this. This is a waste of time. You could have just watched the baby. And then they're like, you need to think, is this young mom where they taught how to take care of baby? Maybe their grandparent who's raised them, or maybe the mom who was taking care of them. Maybe they went to boarding school. They were never taught how to nurture a young child. They were never taught how to care for a younger child. They weren't taught that in boarding school. And so just things that I'd like people to think about. And so when I do talk to young students, I say, you have to understand the historical contents of where your patient comes from. And it's just not black and white that there are a lot of things that are influencing their care, their health status. I think we need a lot more cultural training within medical schools on Native American health, American Indian, Alaska Native health. We have the, the same diseases as others, but what's unique in our population is that 
we have historical trauma that needs to be taken into consideration when assessing patients. And that's sort of the foundation of all the social determinants of health. And it really comes down to the fact that our health care, our well-being, our rights to health, our right to education is really laid in upstream political decisions made by our government so that they say that this is how much money we're getting for our health care. And if you look into, in 2018, the amount of money that went to a patient who had Medicare was over 13000 per capita. The amount of money that went to a Medicaid patient was probably about 12000 per capita. And then you come down and you look at the IHS beneficiary and the amount per capita is about 6000 per year. So when you say under-resourced, that's a big barrier because we're not given enough money to care for all the patients that we need to care for. And then the other aspect of, we talk about like this fellowship program. So we know about GME funding, graduate medical education funding, and IHS has not given any money for graduate medical education. And that's what one of the things that I believe that there is so much that a young physician who wants to work with people who are underserved and under-resourced, that IHS is a great place to learn. But we don't have a GME office. The VA has this huge general medical education office, and they get funding for medical students to go there and residents to go there. IHS gets no funding for that. And the other aspect is fellowship programs. There is no graduate medical education funding for fellowship programs. And so I think those are very, very important high-level issues that should be addressed. Wow. To have less than 50% of what a Medicaid patient would receive is just a shocking number, especially knowing the burden of chronic disease facing the community. That is really eye-opening. What were some of the things, opportunities that were available to you that encouraged you through all of the obstacles you faced to come back, finish your education, and go on into medicine? So during my undergraduate, towards my junior and senior year, I was a IHS or Indian Health Service scholarship recipient, which was great because I paid for my tuition, paid for my books, paid for my fees, but I also got a stipend every month, which allowed me to pay rent and pay for other students who didn't need, if they stayed in the dorm, they could pay their dorm fees from that. So that is a great scholarship. When I was out of high school, I was a recipient of a Chief Manuelito scholarship with my tribe. But now there's really no full ride scholarship from the tribe just because of the number of students that are applying to trying to get into colleges. And and so there's a set amount that is allocated for scholarship monies. But I think the IHS is one way. However, when you get into medical school, I was also an IHS scholarship recipient. They paid for medical school, gave me a stipend. But once you finish your medical school training and you enter a residency, it's a time payback. So if I got four years of scholarship, then I have to give IHS four years of my time back. And unfortunately, one of the issues we run into is, let's say somebody went into internal medicine and towards the end, I really want to be a cardiologist and I want to do a fellowship, a cardiology fellowship, or I want to become a dermatologist. Unfortunately, I guess it's the way this regulation is written that they have to do their time payback first. They can't go on to fellowship directly. Otherwise, they go into default. Once they go into default, they owe three times what they initially were paid. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah. And I've run into this with mentoring residents who are younger that wanted to be a cardiologist. And we brought this up before. And they say, well, this is how it's written in the federal register, which has to be changed through an act of Congress. But those are issues that exist, barriers that exist. And how great would it be for IHS to have their own cardiologists working to 
take care of their patients. But again, this is a structural barrier that we run into probably every year. Wow. We're coming up on time, which is disappointing for me because there's so many more questions I could ask you. But maybe I can end with a question about COVID. How is your community healing from the stressors of COVID and what lingering effects do you continue to see? During COVID, I think we were one of the most restrictive mask mandating and travel and communities that existed during that time. And it was because we were hit so badly. We lost a lot of our elders. We lost people who were keepers of our stories, our songs, our ceremonies. And so, again, that'll take some time to heal from. But I think talking with a couple of other psychologists that I know, that the mental health aspect of post-COVID is really difficult. There's a grieving process that still has not been addressed and is affecting a community that already has a high level of substance use disorder, especially alcohol, and high rates of domestic violence. But on the other hand, we have people who are within our communities, like our tribal council delegates, who are really strong advocates for promoting healing and wellness. Sure. No, that makes sense. Well, let's close then with a question to you about what advice you have for any young trainee looking forward to a long future in medicine. How do you keep the motivation and the spirit alive? My advice would be, first of all, that any community where you serve will be difficult work. And so I think we forget that we need to make sure that we also practice self-care, that we take care of ourselves. I just reminded of a young emergency room doctor that took his life not too long ago. And what do you say? <laughs> you know, when you work in sometimes some difficult thing, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, please don't apologize. You're right. It's difficult. And we don't talk about this enough. And we don't check in on each other enough. And we don't take care of ourselves. And it's so painful. And I'm so sorry for your loss. But those, you know, really taking, reflecting on what you want is so important. And then from there, making sure that you are really practicing self-care, whether it's by taking time out for yourself, journaling, reflecting on things that are happening, exercising, things that keep you motivated, things that bring you positivity and optimism, prayer, meditation, whatever it takes. And then we also have responsibility to each other. I think sometimes we forget that my colleague here, that they're a part of my team and that we need to be able to reach out if we see things that aren't going well and get a conversation started so that we're there to help that individual. Because again, the work is hard, but it also can be rewarding. I want to thank you, honestly, for this honest and vulnerable conversation. I know it couldn't have been easy to share those things. And yet I think that's exactly what's missing when I think back on my own training. There were so many giants I looked up to who seemed to know everything about the latest studies and the right diagnosis. And yet so many times we didn't talk about the hard stuff. It turns out that learning medicine wasn't the hard stuff. And so to have somebody with the benefit of wisdom and many, many years in practice just be so open about the highs and the lows is really, really powerful. And I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this episode of Curbside Consults. I'd like to thank Dr. Adrienne Begay for joining us today and sharing her incredibly powerful story both about her own training as well as the challenges faced in the Indian Health Services and thinking beyond global health as traveling to another country, instead looking for ways to contribute and serve here at home. We are always looking for ways to improve our podcast and educational materials, so if you have any comments or suggestions, please leave us a review on iTunes or email us at resident360 at nejm.org. We would also like to form a focus group to get more formal feedback, so if you're interested in participating, please email resident360 at nejm.org. Our production team at NEJM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston Perry, Kyle Simmons, Mike Thomases, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Also, a special thanks to our NEJM Education Editor, Dr. Opie Hamnick. 
Curbside Consults is brought to you by NEJM Resident 360, a product of NEJM Group.